Okay, thank you for having me. I'm Andrea Vanderwood. I'm the Coast Watch Manager for the Great Lakes. I had to look back on my phone on what day I actually started in this role. I thought it was three years ago. It was actually five years ago. So I can't believe how time has flown over this time period. And if you're not familiar with Coast Watch, I'm going to give you a brief introduction. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we've added over the past five years. And this is an image of Point Pele on Lake Erie. Coast Watch as a whole, it has nodes all over the US and I'll show you where they're located in a minute, but it's primarily focused on ocean color. But also we have partners, not only at the water center, which is part of NOAA, but on measuring water quantity. And we also look at measuring lake color. I have not classically called it that, I still call it ocean color in the Great Lakes. And we have a bunch of resources and satellite data. So we're taking the satellite data from NESDIS, the primary place where satellite data is housed under NOAA. And we're translating that data into products in order for users in the region to um, look at their applications or their needs. One of the interesting pieces of Coast Watch is I'm not able to guess what the user needs are in the region. So part of it is going out and talking to those and the region of interest on what they need for their applications. One prime example is temperature. In the Great Lakes, temperature is heavily used to look at how recently the lakes have been warming. And we have trends of temperature back to the 70s in terms of satellite data and then on water data that you've heard about um, yesterday from Craig Stowe. Some of our other offerings, as I've already mentioned, is ocean color, and this includes chlorophyll, color dissolved organic materials, suspended minerals, how the light attenuates throughout the water column, and how that can affect things um, such as fish species throughout the water column has been of interest in the Great Lakes. In the Great Lakes, we also have al altimetry, and that means that we're able to measure things like winds with sat old satellites like QuickScat and OSHER vector. Ocean vector winds, we also have those in the Great Lakes. So we have lake winds and synthetic aperture radar. Sea ice is highly important as we're looking at low ice coverage of the past year. So this would be lake ice in our case. We do not have salinity measurements for the Great Lakes, but we do have true color imagery, which I'll cover in a minute. I just came back from the Coast Watch meeting. So I came back on Wednesday and then jumped into the Agler meeting uh, at the second half of this week. And so at the end, I have a teaser of really cool new products that were profiled during the um, first half of this week. But during the Coast Watch meeting, each one of these nodes talked about what was new and different. And again, this is a way in which the satellite data from NOAA can be translated into something that's usable. Most people don't know how to work with level one or level zero satellite data, how to apply the atmospheric correction, or how to get it to a chlorophyll product that's useful, just giving a simple example. So we cover not only the US borders, coastal regions, and then us in the Great Lakes and the Water Watch node at the Water Center, but it also includes the polar regions, and that's brand new, and that data will be coming online shortly. So if you have an interest in Antarctica or the Arctic, there will be data that will be coming online in the new future. Our node, as we've heard about the, from yesterday and today, you know, we're celebrating 50 years of GLURL, and our node has been in existence for a good portion of those 50 years. When I look back at all the great work that George has done, George Leshkovich, my predecessor, he really set the tone for Coast Watch in terms of being on the water, measuring ice dynamics, measuring um, the radiative transfer theory, pieces in order to validate the satellite data. And our, our operations manager, I forgot to mention him at the beginning, apologies, that's Sanji Liu, and we work directly and answering user requests, but also providing the data in a timely manner for anybody in the region. Again, we're located in Ann Arbor. We were established in 1990, so 34 years of that 50-year um, anniversary of the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. Our satellite products are wide, as I've covered already, and I'm profiling just a couple of them around the center here. 
I'm going to go through probably four or five different time series, and then I'm going to talk about the exciting new things that we'll be adding. When I first became the Coast Watch Manager, I didn't know that I could add basically any experimental data that I, I wanted or that users wanted in the region in order to be able to answer their, their driving questions in the Great Lakes. And those users include not only people at Glural and Sigler, you heard from Sigler the past couple of days, and, but also NOAA partners, the US Coast Guard and local government agencies and universities, and even um, just uh, anglers in the region or multiple just users of the data within the region have reached out with questions. And they've especially reached out as soon as this website went live. So <laughs> the website that George talked about yesterday was around for many years. And we recently moved our website to the cloud environment under our division of NOAA. And I personally cut out each one of those little phytoplankton on my own. I might have a artistic side to my brain. Um, but and luckily that is live now, but we've had a lot of users reach out to us and say, where is my favorite true color image? So that is the primary use in the Great Lakes. People want to pull up that 250 meter MODIS image, even though I've told them multiple times that your MODIS image might go away any day now because MODIS is very old, way past its lifetime. And transitioning to using a, a NOAA product called VIRS, and there's two different VIRS sensors up in space. Um, but I've received multiple requests. I cannot receive the 250 high resolution data in order to zoom into my region of interest. I want to be able to see where the ice is, even just from that simple true color image, or I want to be able to see what the color of the water is. I really determine even from the color where I bring my fishing boat in order to do fishing. And I've helped them through that process, through screenshots and helping them understand where they can now access the data, but then also making changes. So Sanji and I have worked very hard and diligently over the past year and in the development of this website in order to make those changes. But we still have ERDAP. So ERDAP is our repository for data. It has amazing capabilities to take not only point data, and modeled data that's on a server and satellite data and meld them all together. So it's it can be its own data language on its own, or it can pull out data from a very long time series of satellite data in order to um, create a region of interest. So it's not only the, all the Great Lakes, but you can narrow it down to your region of interest. Our thread server is the other side. It's the web server. So that's where you can download each image individually. So that's as much as I'm gonna go into on in detail on those two. And the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about the imagery. So the highlights of the imagery that over time that has been um, housed on our repository located directly at GLURL, we provide that support at GLURL um, with NESDIS funding in order to support Sanji's time. So a simple basic one that I spoke about in the beginning is sea surface temperature. We've moved that into the future. Back in 1991, we were hosting AVHRR when I started grad school and an undergrad at Michigan Tech with Judy Budd. My job was to look at the AVHRR imagery and say, oh, this is a cloudy day. This is not a cloudy day. All the way up until now where we have a a merged product of Oxbow SST, which includes not only our US measured temperature from satellites, but also European satellites into one merged product. And we also still host the classic GOES imagery throughout this time period. Another piece, oh, I didn't know Sanji had that one in there, sorry. It came up as a, an add-on. As I said, true color imagery is the most frequently used product in the Great Lakes. I think over time, they'll start using some of the new ones that I, I will profile at the end here, but it started with MODIS. So in 2004, we have that 250 meter MODIS imagery and then onto VIRS, which is a NOAA satellite. And then we also have Ulchi imagery, which is 300 meter imagery at the highest resolution. And that's a, on a European satellite. So slowly transitioning people from the MODIS to VIRS into ULTRA imagery as secondary 
options with um, the limited capacity and lifetime of MODIS. And then George yesterday spoke about ice concentration and ice types, and that has classically been his area of expertise. And we still work with the headquarters in Washington, DC at NESDIS, actually College Park, um, to be able to translate that imagery to something usable in the Great Lakes. We've also partnered with Michigan Tech Research Institute, and that was George's initiation in the past, and they put out a product using um, an optimization routine that from the data that's measured on the water, the obstacle data that's measured on the water, they back calculate chlorophyll, dissolved organic carbon, suspended minerals, and then other attenuation products as well as secondary uh, products to that. And then they also have a scheme to calculate CDOM. So those have been from MODIS and VIRS, and we have a science quality and then an experimental quality. And through this, we have a partnership with EPA, with Glimpo, to update this for the near shore region and for their survey areas for the Lake Guardian. So they're supposed to be delivering that this week. So stay tuned and um, online you'll see even more data um, giving a long-term time series of chlorophyll in the Great Lakes and the other CPA products. Another piece, which is one of my favorites to look at, especially during the winter season, is the synthetic aperture radar imagery. And I think it was last year, maybe the year before, but a memorandum of understanding was signed to include all of the Canadian radar set imagery and to make that readily available, including the European Sentinel 1 A and B imagery, which there wasn't a memorandum of understanding that was already available and on NRCS imagery. And if you're not familiar with radar imagery, it can see through the clouds. So it provides great capabilities. And at the end here, I will talk about some new capabilities that I'm very excited about providing to people. We also have radar winds. And if you've looked at those in, at all in the past, they provide really interesting information. One of my um, colleagues in my group provided um, an image which if you want to see later on, uh, come and talk to me of an instability of the winds in Lake Michigan this past summer, which shows really cool uh, meandering features all along Lake Michigan. So this is important not only for model development, but also val validating any models that require winds as a parameter. I think this is the last one I'm going to cover before I'll talk about some new developments. And um, OXPO, again, is that combined merged data set for sea surface temperature. And this is the Great Lakes envir surface environmental analysis, first developed by Dave Schwab. And I've dove into the code. It's 1,600 lines long <laughs> just for this one merge product that covers a gapped free image of temperature. So on the bottom left, you're seeing surface temperature. And in the winter, we include the extent of ice. So there's also a parameter for ice. But this provides really key information in looking at long-term statistics. And we have similar plots for ice, and we have similar plots for chlorophyll that we're developing right now to look at um, how temperature has changed throughout the season. So we've started to get calls from people primarily located by Lake Michigan saying, why is the lake so hot? What is happening? It's way above the long-term trend. So each one of, I don't know if you can see it on the back, but each one of the light blue lines is a se separate year. And then the orange line is what the, um, what the temperature is looking like for this year. So that's that top orange line. And I can't see it very well from my screen. So, but um, yeah, it, we do it for each individual lake when we calculate those temperatures and for the Great Lakes wide for synoptic coverage. So now let's talk about the new products. So some of the, some of the new products have been funded under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. I'm gonna cover about five cool things that we're about to bring into Coastwatch and ones that we already have. So this past year, we added water clarity, and this was developed by Guangming Zhang at NESDIS, and he's an applications um, scientist with the Cooperative Institute. And the reference for the paper is there, but it gives you a range of water clarity be, um, around the Great Lakes, and it's also a turbidity index. And this was funded not only by, actually it was under an interagency agreement with Glimpo. 
that this was funded about a year ago. We're now providing daily ice thickness, which is important for those in the region. And then it was a milestone and deliverable to provide the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System output and the Hindcast data on our web server. And so that's been, is in works and a good portion of that has been placed on there with an interest and overlapping satellite data with the modeled parameters, as well as people wanting to go back in time, say, what did the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System, which is our experimental mode of that model look, look like in time. Future directions, this is a segue to Steve's talk after me, Steve Ruberg's talk. I talked about how ERDAP can take that point data and the satellite data and the model data and overlap all three of them to obtain important information. So not only do we use on-water data for validation efforts of what the satellite is seeing from space, because that's not always truth. And you could argue that what we're seeing on the water and measuring is not only tr always truth, depending upon the measurement accuracy, but we can also add in the uh, Steve Ruberg's recon data, and that's the data around the Great Lakes where we're measuring multiple parameters that could be overlaid with the satellite and um, model data. So that's exciting into the future. And into the future, we're looking at long time series of what's happening at each one of those locations and being able to project into the future what could happen. I'm going to switch directions a little bit on other offerings that we'll have in the Great Lakes. So I manage a uh, a program that flies an airplane over the Great Lakes in addition to Coast Watch that uses a hyperspectral camera. Hyperspectral meaning hundreds of bands that we're looking at, much shorter than what the eye can see. And so we're working to provide that data in-house on Coast Watch that you can access easily. So this is the airplane, an example image of when we flew over a freighter. And then a new development that isn't happening anywhere else in Coast Watch is providing the um, uncrewed aircraft systems. I also manage that piece. Some of that has been moved over to our engineer, Lauren Marshall, at NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. And that could be in coordination with the Great Lakes Center of Expertise. We are doing it right now for CHAB monitoring and then for the ice type validation. This is my last slide. <laughs> Thank you. This is my last slide. So these are the exciting things coming. I didn't want to take things from people's presentations without asking. So I, I made a list from this past week. So when you scroll through the SAR imagery, it's very difficult to find your favorite lake. And I'm a little bit biased. Mine is Lake Superior, but it's very difficult to find your favorite lake. So they are starting to offer browsable capabilities or synoptic imagery, again, for SAR, but they have a surfactants algorithm, which will have, it won't pull out and say it's oil or pull out and say it's HABs, but it could be used for that application. There's also a new coastal flood depth um, product using VIRS, which will be very helpful for coastal inundation mapping. It's been proven, they've done a lot of testing that it has high accuracy, and again, increased resolution of that SAR winds, one sub one meter scale. And then lastly, Guangming is also, Zhang is also funded to do phytoplankton community composition through VIRS, and that'll soon be, be available on the Coast Watch website. But my exciting part is being able to have the uncrewed data on there as well. And I thought I would talk too fast. Thank you. <laughs> No, thank you. You are perfectly on time with one minute for questions. Oh, great. Thanks. I'll go back to the cool new offerings. So we are going to have the daily ice uh, sickness data. It's already available. It's, uh, in, it will be available in, in digital form. Yes, okay. Sanji has already um, pulled it from Coast Watch Central, and it's available on our node already. Okay, thank you. I don't know the exact date when he started pulling That's it. That's good news. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Steve has one in the back. Thank you. Thanks, Gio. What's the process for <clears throat> new experimental product products? How do you get those plugged into Coast Watch? 
that was the question I asked last week because I was never educated well on, oh, can I put this cool new product up there? And there's a designation that other nodes put of experimental or uh, they had another designation at the beginning in ERDAP or in the thread server and the name of the experimental um, product. But yeah, I was excited to hear that it's not as difficult as a process as I thought it was, which yeah, I think we can really move things forward into the future because of that. <laughs>